after a 19-week-long hiatus that saw alcohol arrive in convenience stores and an announcement to build a tunnel under the 401, the Ontario Legislature returned this week with no shortage of issues to deal with. To bring us up to speed on what the Ford government has been up to and the reaction it's stirred up across the province, we welcome. In Sudbury, Ontario, Marcus Schwabe. He's the host of Morning North on CBC Radio 1. In Windsor, Ontario, Patty Handysides, host of The Shift on AM 800 CKLW. And in London, Ontario, Devin Peacock, host of The Morning Show on 980 CFPL. And it's great to have you three fellow hosts uh, with us here tonight on TVO. You know, I want to start with just a general premise, which is to say that uh, when things happen here in the capital city, we tend to oftentimes uh, believe everything begins and ends here. And uh, the reason we like you three on the program tonight is that we want to see how things are sort of playing uh, outside of the capital city. So, Patty, start us off here. The whole issue of taking out bike lanes and the province opting to pay for them uh, seems very directed at the capital city. Does this have any effect in your neck of the woods? And if so, what? Well, you know, our mayor was one of the first outside of two big mayors to be given strong mayor power. So we've been interested to see how much extra, uh, you know, kind of, uh, power that uh, the province wanted to have here in Windsor. It, it came at an interesting time, this this whole announcement of, of the province having the say in taking out a, a traffic lane. That very week, there was a, a very long street going into downtown Windsor. Uh, that was actually happening. They were It was a one-way street, but they were taking a full lane out to make a bike lane that very week. Decided on, consulted by the city of Windsor and the people in the neighborhood to do that. Um, but to take that away... Uh, take that power away from the people in the city is is a, a lot of controversy here over whether the province should have those kind of step those chances to step in and step on uh, municipal decisions like that and to take away the public consultation rights. Hmm. Marcus, how about in Sudbury? Is that bike lanes a big issue there? Um, bike lanes are a big issue for the people who want bike lanes, but I would say that they want more. Uh, and I, you've been to Sudbury, Steve. You know that traffic is not an issue here uh, like it is down in Toronto. Uh, so we have some bike lanes. In fact, there was a major project not that long ago just to complete it uh, through a thoroughfare through Sudbury. And what they did is they put the bike lane on the sidewalk. So maybe it's the pedestrians in the north that are more concerned, but they still have their room as well. But uh, that's really not an issue for Sudbury at all. Devin, how about in London? Bike lanes are an issue, and they aren't. So it's an interesting situation for London where they're not particularly popular amongst uh, some uh, Londoners, but as it relates to this legislation specifically, a lot of the bike lanes we have in London aren't on major arteries. And in the areas where we do have bike lanes on some of the bigger thoroughfares, they've actually expanded the road to include the bike lanes. So some of what the, the, the province and the premier is talking about hasn't really uh, it doesn't really impact London here. What is interesting about it, though, is London is doing its mobility master plan right now, which does include uh, bike lanes as well as other modes of transportation. So there is a possibility that future bike lanes could be impacted by this, but it's not really known yet. But it's it's not a, a huge impact for London at the moment. Interesting, because, Patty, you know, in the capital city, if you turn on talk radio in this town, I mean, it's just... I don't want to say it's nonstop, but it's such a huge issue, you know. And, of course, some hosts like to foment the whole war on the car and motorists versus cyclists and all of that. Do you get much of that in Windsor? We do, actually. We have a very vocal uh, cycling group and, and people that, that like to do it. But the city, you know, just isn't at the any time really putting any kind of... Uh, particular strong bike lanes in. They're painting lines in and then that they're doing that. But uh, we're like the other cities too, outside of the capital city. Um, we don't have any bike lanes on our main arteries and, and obviously any freeway or anything else going in there. So there is a constant battle when new roads are being done or roads are being resurfaced to put in more better bike lanes that are buffered. But uh, that's kind of a, a never ending battle here. Gotcha. Okay, let's go on. And Devin, I want to ask you, because London, of course, snuggles right up to the 401, I want to ask you about the Premier's plan to put a tunnel under at least part of the 401 that's in Toronto. Now, Londoners take this highway a lot. How did they react to this development? Uh, they reacted uh, with a bit of a smile. 
uh, <laughs> in terms of uh, the idea of a tunnel. Um, it, it was one of those stories where, you know, I'm from Toronto originally, so I have a soft spot for Toronto, but I've been in London for over 20 years now, and it just seems there's a lot of focus on Toronto and not as much focus on London. So a lot of uh, Londoners saw the idea of a tunnel underneath the 401 as uh, yet again something that's maybe for Toronto, not necessarily for London or even southwestern Ontario. When we did talk about it, London, though, was more an issue of why not just buy back the 407? Because the Londoners do like to go to Toronto, go through Toronto, and would like to use the 407. Uh, but that was the, the bigger thing for us in terms of if we're going to do something, forget the tunnel, just buy back the 407. Marcus, I know the 401's a long way away from Sudbury, but having said that, sometimes the talk we hear in Toronto is that the Premier sometimes looks like he would prefer to be the mayor of Toronto as opposed to the Premier of Ontario. Does that kind of chit-chat make its way up to Sudbury? Absolutely. And when it comes to a tunnel, we've got the expertise in northern Ontario. We're hard rock miners up here. We can build that tunnel if you're going to pay for it. Um, and, and it's interesting because uh, Sudbury does have a tunnel, a, a municipal tunnel, under its infrastructure, uh, under the entire city. And I'm not talking about mines. I'm talking about a sewage tunnel that's been built over the last 20 years, and it actually carries sewage from one end of the city uh, to the treatment plant. Uh, so for a government to build a tunnel it isn't out of the question. But you're talking about a lot of money. And, and there's other highways in northern Ontario that have been promised. The four-laning of Highway 69 between Sudbury and Toronto. Uh, it's been talked about for years. Uh, been promised. They say it's still a priority, but for the last eight years, nothing has been done in terms of expanding that uh, four-laning. So uh, definitely, I would say Northerners feel a little left out when there's all this talk about Toronto traffic. Well, lest we uh, convey the impression that nothing has been done on that, some of the 69 is four-laned, right? Absolutely. Some of it has been done, uh, but there is a stretch of 80 kilometers that uh, it was promised back to the Liberal administrations, and it still hasn't been done. Okay. Patty, of course, 401 does go to Windsor, and I just wonder how, I wonder how the people of Windsor feel about the notion of, um, of their taxes going into, uh, oh, I don't know, 50 to $100 billion for a tunnel underneath the 401 across Toronto. Well, we already have an existing bridge and an existing tunnel here that connects us over to Detroit. And we have a new tunnel that's about to open in less than 12 months. I mean, a new bridge that's about to open in 12 months. We understand the undertaking of this. Uh, you know, it's been more than 20 years since they decided to build a new bridge here. It's only about two and a half kilometers long, not nearly what Doug Ford's talking about with this tunnel. It's over water and land, not under. And it's at uh, it's it's now past six and a half billion dollars at the cost, and it hasn't opened yet. Um, and and just the time, the design time. You know, it took years and thousands of wells to be drilled to make sure it could afford it could take the weight. You got to find out whether the ground can support things like that. There's so much design and work and infrastructure ideas and engineering to go into this, and without even talking about money to begin with, we know that it's going to be incredibly expensive. I like the idea. We talked about it here in our news, and why don't they just buy back the 407? It'll be cheaper than building this tunnel. Yeah, you know, I hear that suggestion all the time. And yet, Devin, I have, uh, well, I've yet to hear anybody in government say that it's a, a, an option that they are pursuing or even considering. You think they should consider it? I think they should consider it. You know, I was just on the 407 recently when I was uh, going through uh, Toronto to go up for uh, to the cottage for Thanksgiving. The 407 is always seems to have uh, tons of space. When we talk about gridlock and uh, getting stuck in traffic, that Toronto traffic is terrible. I, I do agree something needs to be done about it. But uh, when we've talked about it here, it's, it's bring back the 407. Not only do you not have to wait for 25, 30, however many years, it's right there. So 407 seems like uh, the, the easy direction to go. And then if you need to build a tunnel after that, then, okay, we'll, we'll talk about the tunnel. <laughs> well, there's a fall economic statement coming from the Minister of Finance next week. So we'll see, if there, uh, we'll see if there are a few cents in there for potentially buying back the 407. We'll see. Marcus, let's talk about health care. Uh, we all know that health services in northern Ontario are, um, well, uh, let's just say much more difficult to come by than they are down south of the French River. What are you hearing up north in terms of um, the government's plans? And we saw the announcement this past week to hire Jane Philpott to study, within five years, a solution to getting everybody a general practitioner in this province. What are you hearing? Actually, 
some excitement, frankly, uh, from healthcare providers in Northern Ontario. I talked to a, a doctor in Wawa who thought it sounds like an awful big job. The promise that every Ontarian will be connected to a primary care provider. Now, that's not necessarily a, a doctor. It could also mean a nurse practitioner. And we talked to a nurse practitioner as well who was thrilled that nurse practitioners are included in that. Um, and we also heard from uh, a, a, do a doctor in Timmins who uh, works in the emergency, and he said he was a family doctor, but he says there's no money in it as a family physician with a practice. You've got the overhead. So he works in ER exclusively now and, and says it's just not the headaches to become a family doctor. So clearly there's a problem. Uh, there's some hope. I talked to the, uh, the head of uh, Nossam University, the School of Medicine in Sudbury and Thunder Bay, and uh, she was involved with a, a report that uh, Dr. Jane Philpott wrote uh, regarding primary health care, uh, talking about how you'd move into a certain postal code and you'd be immediately uh, connected to a primary care ph physician or some sort of clinic that might include social workers, might include uh, dietitians. Uh, but she mentioned that it could cost $2 billion. So uh, there's politics here, clearly, that the, if, if someone is, is worried, they'd say they, they don't have a family doctor. And of course, a lot of people don't have a family doctor in this province. Uh, now the, the government can say, well, look, we're studying it. We're going to take care of you. It's just going to take a little while. Hmm. Patty, uh, two and a half million people in this province, last I heard, do not have access to a primary care doctor. Um, I'm sure a lot of them live in Windsor. How was this announcement reacted to in your part of the province? I mean, people are, are very excited to hear anything that sounds like there may be some improvement on health care, because not only are so many people still without family health care doctors, and a lot of that is as our doctors are aging and retiring, not as many work to 80 or 90 anymore like they used to, and uh, they're retiring and people are lost not having that doctor to fill in afterwards. But also we have a lot of newcomers. We have a lot of people moving here because of jobs, and you know, there's just no doctors. But the other thing, <clears throat> excuse me, the other thing here is because we're right on the border, uh, the wait times, I mean, I'm sure the wait times are, are, are as extensive everywhere, for, especially for diagnostic testing. People here cross the border and pay in Michigan uh, to have diagnostic testing. They get the results back within a day or two or three days, and they bring it back to their doctor so they can move on to that next step, whether it's seeing a surgeon or some kind of specialist. Um, but that's what it's got to now. Because we're so close to it, we see the advertisements on television selling us that you can go to these diagnostic uh, clinics that are all over Metro Detroit. Uh, and people do, and they pay the money, and they're willing to do that so that they can uh, move ahead on that line. That is fascinating because for all the people who say we don't have two-tier health care here in Canada, uh, it's not the case. Our second tier is just... Uh... Well, in your case in Windsor, it's just north in Detroit. I guess for the rest of us, it would be south in the United States. Okay, Devin, give us the lay of the land in London. How, the, the notion that Jane Philpott has five years to solve this problem, how was that reacted to there? Uh, excitement, uh, because there's a lot of Londoners that uh, do not have a, a family doctor. The number seems to grow every single time we do a story on it here and, and talk to doctors and, and talk to those uh, involved with it. So there's uh, some optimism uh, because it is uh, Dr. Phil Pot is specifically who is involved with this and is, is taking this on, but also just some skepticism as well because of the prospect of, you know, a provincial election uh, potentially early in 2025. The fact this does does take five years. That's a long time for a lot of people. And every time we see the numbers come out, it's, uh, you know, by five years from now, how many more Londoners are going to be without a family doctor? London is one of the fastest growing cities, not just in Ontario, but the entire country. Uh, you know, we have, a, we have a housing issue here, of course, but also it's it's for family doctors and uh, healthcare providers. It's a significant issue. So it was warmly received, but there's a bit of skepticism just in terms of Five years is a long time to potentially have to wait. Mm. Marcus, let's just do a, a word or two here on the politics of this move. This is, of course, the former Liberal Health Minister federally, Jane Philpott, being hired by a progressive Conservative Premier of Ontario to do a study, which, of course, takes her out of the mix as being a potential candidate in the next Ontario election, and she had been musing about that. What's your take on the politics of this move? Well, I don't think Bonnie Crombie will be thrilled that uh, Dr. Philpott is 
uh, doing this work for the conservative government. But I think it's a great uh, great strategy for the conservatives. It takes away a potential candidate uh, from the liberals. Uh, but, it, but it also makes them appear to be, you know, nonpartisan, that uh, we have the best interests of Ontarians at heart, and uh, we're going to solve this problem that's been plaguing the province for years. Let's show you guys some tape here. This is Marit Stiles, the leader of the official opposition, with some strong words for the Premier in question period on Tuesday of this week. Sheldon, if you would, roll it. This government is failing every day to deliver on the most basic responsibility of a provincial government, which is health care for the people of this province. But somehow, they're able to keep all their promises to their insider wealthy friends. So I want to know from the Premier, why is this government choosing to spend billions on luxury spas that no one wants and a tunnel that won't be built for 20 years when they can't get sick people out of hallways? Patty, this is a line, frankly, we're hearing from all of the opposition parties that the Premier has sort of lost the plot and is uh, favoring his insider donors to the Conservative Party. Uh, any idea if that's resonating in southwestern Ontario? Uh, absolutely. There's a lot of talk here. Yeah, Doug Ford still certainly has some big supporters here. There's no doubt in some of the things he's doing. But health care and housing uh, is the thing that gets, you know, drawn. It's just constant talk about health care and housing. For us, housing has become a really huge issue. I, I know everyone's facing that, but we're having a, more than a thousand new people every month coming here. We've got jobs. We've got a new EV battery plant that's about to open. We've got, uh, you know, construction jobs. We've got a new hospital about to be built. So there's people moving here, but we don't have the housing. And just in the last seven or eight years, our housing prices have more than tripled. We used to be very affordable. It's not anymore. And that's a big problem. And it's talked about daily, hourly here. And yet, at the same time, yeah, we are hearing, it, it resonates loud and clear here that there's this some kind of spa going up in Toronto, the tunnel that came out of left field. Even back when he started talking about there needs to be paper bags at the LCBO, those kind of issues bothered people. And, and so, you know, they, they want to hear more on healthcare, not just bringing in Jane Philpott, but bringing, you know, doing more. They want to see it. They want to see some results. Devin, how about you on that? It's an interesting uh, dynamic in London. We have three NDP MPPs and one progressive conservative uh, just uh, south that borders part of London. So we have a lot of New Democrat uh, representation. In terms of that message uh, resonating deeply, I, I think it's cracking through a little bit, but really a lot of Londoners are really just concerned about encampments, homelessness, and uh, housing is is a huge concern, uh, similar to, to Windsor. Uh, we have uh, a, a big problem with encampments, and I know the Ontario big city mayors uh, were uh, calling on the province recently to do something and, and, and step in on that and think more about involuntary treatment, but uh, encampments is really the message that uh, is something we're talking about a lot in homelessness. It's it's something that's almost a, a daily uh, topic here. It's, it cannot be stated enough. Uh, so that message resonates a little bit it, but uh, I don't even think that kind of speaks to what people in London are really concerned about. Marcus, correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think the Tories have won a seat in Sudbury in almost 40 years. Maybe it was Jim Gordon the last guy to win the seat there for the Tories? Jim Gordon, absolutely, former yeah. mayor of Sudbury. Okay, so how's Doug Ford playing in Sudbury these days? Uh, well, we're so far removed of what's going on in Queen's Park that uh, the issue of health care, it has been an issue, but I think it's it has pushed down on the list of, of concerns. I think a lot of the, the interest groups, including the Ontario Medical Association, the Ontario Healthcare, uh, Healthcare Coalition, they've been very good about getting their message out that, that more needs to be done. And of course, Franz Jelena, the NDP MPP for Nickel Belt, is uh, the NDP's health critic. So you, you hear her frequently talking about the concerns with healthcare, in particular, the privatization of health in, in uh, Ontario. But I, I think uh, Patty and, and uh, Devon are right in that uh, homelessness, even in Sudbury, is a big issue. More people on the streets than we've ever seen before. Uh, and the opioid crisis is a real concern up here. Uh, housing, even in Sudbury, is, is a real concern. Uh, cost of rent has gone up. Uh, affordability is a real issue. So uh, I, I think the health care, while it's always a concern, and, and uh, at least the Ford government can say now, we're studying it, taking a look at it, we're going to try to help you get a doctor. And, and of course, Sault Ste. Marie was a huge example. 10,000 people de-rostered, mm. uh, lost their family doctor in, in, the, in the Sioux. Uh, so it's still an issue. Uh, 
they were able to bring in some nurse practitioners to, to help deal with that. Apparently they're overworked and there's people still waiting for a long time to get uh, to see a nurse practitioner or a doctor. But um, I, I think some of these other issues, cost of living as well, have sort of gone up on the, on the scale of issues. In which case, in my last couple of minutes here, let's ask, um, let's ask how people would react to the notion of spending $150 million a year before they had to on an election next spring, which we are not confirmed, but may happen. And also the notion, which we hear next week will come down, this um, $3 billion plus that will be spent to give everybody a $200 rebate uh, next spring as well. Again, potentially just before a spring election. Patty, how's that playing? Well, I can tell you, I, I think people are already tired of elections here, and that's because we're so close to Detroit that we are inundated with the presidential campaign next door. Um, and of course, there's the talk too about what will happen on the federal side. When it comes to the Ontario government, uh, if they were to call an election early, I don't know. I, and it's funny, I, I, every time an election is called or a by-election is needed, somebody steps down and there's a by-election. I always think about the cost. We do talk about it. We have stories on it. Um, but it doesn't seem to really rile up the people about the cost of an election so much as um, just, you know, obviously uh, who's going to be running. Devin, with uh, all of the priorities that need some attention right now, how would people in London feel about uh, three plus billion dollars for an early election and $200 checks in the mail next spring? I don't think people will be too enthused about the idea of a, a provincial election. I don't hear a lot of people clamoring uh, for something along those lines. With regards to the rebate, uh, every time I talk to it uh, with, with people, sometimes they're surprised to hear that it would be happening and they'll take it, but they don't really think, uh, you know, $200 a person, if that is end, uh, what ends up being, is is not the, the biggest uh, uh, boon for them. So people's... I've, when I've talked to them, they, they'll take it, but they don't think they really need it. And it's kind of, uh, that's money that would be much better spent, you know, on the homelessness, encampments, and some of the uh, more pressing issues, even housing. There's there's a lot bigger issues than uh, $200 in everyone's pocket. Marcus, you get the last 20 seconds on that. Well, I'm sure the opposition parties are thinking uh, and creating a list of what could be done with $3 billion. All the listeners that we had uh, who contacted us via text or on our talkback line, they're saying uh, they see what this is, uh, is what it is, uh, and that is a, a ploy to win votes. But hey, if you found 200 bucks on the street, would you pick it up and take it? I'm sure. People are going to take it. Um, whether or not they want an election, well... We'll have to see. We shall see, indeed. Patty Handicides from CKLW, Devin Peacock from CFPL, Marcus Schwabe, CBC Radio 1 in Sudbury. It's great to have you three with us here on TVO tonight. Many thanks. Thank you. Thanks.